begin by sharing with you a story that I heard about a minister who, uh, after 20 years of diligent ministry, faithful, dedicated service, he left the ministry and he became a funeral director. He was asked, why did he change vocations? And he said, you know, I, I spent 10 long years of my life trying to straighten out John. And he is still to this day an alcoholic. I spent three and a half years diligently working and, and wrestling with Harold and Susie's marriage. They still ended up getting divorced. Five long years of my life were invested in trying to walk alongside of Steve to help him kick his drug habit. And to this day, he is still an addict. Well, now when I straighten people out, they stay straight. <laughs> Anyone that is engaged in ministry at any level knows the frustration of wondering if anything that you are trying to do for God is actually bearing fruit. Faithfulness does not always mean fruitfulness. For every Jonah, there happens to be an Amos. And, and it's something for a guy like me that lives in ministry like I do, it's, it's hard for me to understand this. I mean, Jonah, he had a, a lousy attitude. He had a bigoted spirit. And he goes and he preaches once. And an entire city repents and revival breaks out. And then there's Amos. He's dedicated. He's Faithful, he's humble, he preaches and he preaches and he preaches, and there is no evidence that anyone responded. But to say that Amos' ministry was not fruitful in his lifetime does not mean that Amos' ministry has not borne fruit. The Holy Spirit preserved the preaching of Amos for a reason. And I want to explore that with you today. Because what if God was not just aiming at Israel? What if he was aiming at us? You have to remember that Amos did not grow up intending to be a prophet. When Amaziah, the priest of the king's chapel, told him to go back to Judah, earn your bread prophesying there, well, look at what Amos said in response to that in chapter 7. Amos answered, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Do you remember how Amos begins his prophecy in the book of Amos? He says, the Lord roared from Zion. Amos was a man who had heard in his soul the roar of the Lord. So his life was measured by just one aim. And, and you need to know that. You see, his aim was to faithfully answer the call to speak for God. That's all that mattered to Amos. That's why he could be so relentless in the face of unceasing hostility and apathy. By the way, it's a lot harder to keep preaching in the face of apathy than it is in the face of hostility. As we know, as you study through Amos, and some people in Israel really hated Amos. They told him to leave. But you get the impression, when you read through the book, that most people just ignored him. He was that crazy old prophet from Judah who always talked about the poor. But you see, despite all of this pressure to, to just leave and go away, Amos had heard a go from God that trumped any other go he received. He had to speak because he knew that he had been spoken to. Remember what Peter said about the prophets? My son read this right at the beginning of worship. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit. And they spoke from God. Amos was determined to execute his orders. 
It wasn't important that Amos be loved. It was important that Amos be heard. And I think it is by his faithfulness to his ministry that Amos should actually be judged by us. He was true to his calling. Yes, it is a reality that the Israelite nation still went into captivity 40 years later. It is a fact that nobody listened. It is a fact that no one repented. It is true. Revival never came. But he was true to his calling. A calling that exposed the most popular untruths in Israel. So I want to review the two chief lies that Amos preached against over and over in his book. Lie number one. Just be more religious. Remember, the problem in Israel is not that the houses of worship were empty. The problem in Israel was that the hearts of the worshipers were. People thought that they could manipulate God by doing the right thing. R-I-T-E. The, the rituals, the regulations, the hoops that you jump through to prove that you are actually a religious person. They thought if they could do the right thing, Things that it did not matter in their lives if they were full of the wrong things. So what happened is that religion in Israel got completely divorced from ethics. But Amos brought a word from God that said that what happens in the sanctuary cannot be disconnected from what happens in the street. Robert Chapman was a good friend of George Mueller and he was asked one time, would you advise that young Christians do something for the Lord? He said, no. And people were shocked. Why would you say that? He said, I would advise that you do everything for the Lord. You see, somehow in America, like in the days of Amos, we have created this mindset that says, you know, there's my secular world over here, and there's my spiritual world over there. And Amos would say, no. You do everything for the Lord. The way you run your business, the way you treat your neighbor, the way that you treat the poor, all of it is connected and God is actually offended by your religion if it is not the product of a life that is blessing people throughout the week. So Amos, speaking on behalf of the Lord, said in chapter 5, I hate all your show and pretense, the hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I won't even notice all your choice peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your hearts. Instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice. An endless river of righteous living. That is a major theme in Amos. That religion that majors in the sanctuary but minors in the street produces hypocrites. Jesus would pick up on the same theme. You see, the problem in Jesus' day was not that the houses of worship were empty. It was that the hearts of the worshipers were empty. So he said in Matthew 23, verse 23, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without ignoring the former. Which leads right into the second lie that Amos just hammers over and over in his preaching, and that is that justice is not a spiritual issue. Amos lived in a day much like ours when the common understanding was that certain subjects were, were not appropriate for church. I mean, you had your church subjects and you had your other subjects that you just, you don't bring those up in the pulpit. So they told Amos, Go back to Judah with all of your liberal social ideas. But here is the problem. The very first part of Psalm chapter 19, verse, or Psalm chapter 9, verse 16. The very first part of that verse says, The Lord is known by his 
justice. It is so critical to remember this. In the Old Testament, particularly in the prophets, justice is not so much about punishing guilty people as it is about protecting the innocent. It is essentially an economic issue involving an understanding of who it is that owns what. And as I've said this before, the question is answered for us in the very first verse of the Bible. God made everything so it ain't yours. That's the Damascus Standard Version. <laughs> God wants every person to be able to benefit from his creation. And that's why Israel had the most radical economic theory that the world had ever seen, including this incredible concept called Jubilee, which meant that every 50 years there would be a limit placed on the accumulation of wealth. Under their system, the rich were not supposed to just get rich and rich and rich and rich. Every 50 years, you started all over. People would get their land back. People actually had a, a chance to have a fresh start again. Injustice in the Bible involves depriving somebody of access to God's creation. So injustice is ultimately a problem between a man and his God, which makes it very clearly a spiritual issue. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 31. He who oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. But whoever is kind to the needy honors God. You go over into the New Testament, if you don't like Old Testament verses. James 1, 27 says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. By the way, in the Greek, there is no and in that verse. You see, in James' mind, taking care of widows and orphans is how you keep yourself unstained, unpolluted from the world. It's, it's how you don't get caught up by the contaminating values in the world that just wants you to have more and more and more and more. Jesus picked up the theme of doing justice so much in his teaching, perhaps the best known parable that Jesus shared on this topic is the parable of the sheep and the goats. Matthew chapter 25, verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and, and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. A fundamental principle of life under God is that we take care of each other. This is not a social gospel. This is recognizing the social implications of the gospel. I know that there are people in the world that preach justice and they never mention Jesus. You can do that. You can preach justice and never mention Jesus. But I'm telling you today from this pulpit that you cannot preach Jesus and never mention justice. Justice is an intensely spiritual issue. So as Christians, what does Amos say to us? We've been through this study now for nine weeks. This is the tenth sermon. Ten weeks we've been studying Amos. Well, it says this. It says that we must promote the liberation of poor people from poverty and oppression and from sin. And we need to also liberate rich people from greed, from materialism, from apathy. Concern for justice is one of the identifying marks of the true church. That's why I believe that the Holy Spirit preserved the sermons of a basically ignored prophet from the backwoods of Tekoa. Because God is still aiming at us. So I want to ask you three important questions this morning. And as you wrestle with the answers to these questions, you're going to know whether or not you got the message of Amos or not. First question. Do my eyes see injustice when others 
can't. There is so much injustice in the world, it becomes easy to just accept it. And this is especially true if the way things are really just work for you. I mean, it is hard to recognize injustice if the way the system works just works for you. You don't see how it doesn't work for others. When I was growing up, one of my very best friends was a young man named Arthur. Also had a best friend named Raymond. We call ourselves Ram. Raymond, Arthur, and Mike. Yeah. <laughs> then we got a friend named Clay. We call ourselves Cram. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Arthur was, was inseparable to me. We were very close. Arthur was black. I remember one time that he opened up and he just shared with me. This is 1977. Things were different for him and his family than they were for my family. I didn't really see it. I didn't get it. Until one night, I invited Arthur to come stay the night at my home. My mother, of course, said, yeah, no problem. She was newly married at the time, hadn't been married maybe even two months. I mean, this was new. And Arthur was there, we were playing Atari in the living room, and my stepfather came home from work, and as he comes into the house, he, he sees Arthur and everything's fine. And then after a while, he kind of kind of looks at his wife and says, okay, Arthur, I think it's probably time for you to head home, buddy. And I said, oh, no, 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 mom said he could stay the night. To which he stood up and he said, there's no way I'm sleeping in the same house with them. And he used the N-word. And what broke out in the living room that night was a humongous fight between my mother and my then new stepfather, who ended up sleeping in the cab of his truck and Arthur stayed the night at our house. <laughs> but I all of a sudden was exposed to how different and hard life was for him than it was for me. See, the system just worked for me, so I didn't see it. Our congregation has twice been to Sholo, Arizona, where we have worked with the Apache tribe on the White Mountain Indian Reservation. And when you are on the reservation, it is hard to not see injustice. It is hard to not see a system that is working very efficiently, mind you, at keeping those who are poor in the position of their poverty. The spiritual reality is that the reservation is a very dark place, and that is why I consider Matt and Karen McLean, who work there with the Apaches every single day, to be heroic people. They felt the burden of God to go and work there. He had a job as a heating and cooling guy. She worked in the school system and left all that from Indiana to go work in Arizona with a people unlike their own. And that, that is amazing to me. And by the way, um, we're going to go back. My prayer is that we will do it in the summer of 2016 for another mission trip. And I would ask you to be thinking right now about how you might be involved in that trip with us as we go next summer. Another question for us to consider as we think about the message of Amos. Does my heart feel a burden when others don't? Do you remember at the end of one of Amos's sermons, he shared this little phrase, you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. I believe that one of the most important ministries that the Holy Spirit has is to, is to keep us from coping with evil by becoming catalyst. See, because that is one way that people do cope with the evil. There is so much evil in the world that one way we cope is to just let our, our hearts get hard to it so we don't feel evil anymore. But, but God gives us the Holy Spirit. He, in, he in, in, indwells us. So that our hearts don't become hard to that. So we can always see it and know the burden in the heart of God. 
We're never going to own problems if we don't feel them. Our church supports a mission, Roth House. Up on the screen, the girl that is in the forefront here on your left, her name is Edie. She is a brand new arrival at the newest safe house in Haiti. She's 12 years old. She's a beautiful girl. <coughs> she has lived a nightmare. Since she was nine, she has been prostituted almost every night. The very night that she was rescued at the police station, she hugged the worker who was helping her from Rafa House. And the worker said what she said to her was, thank you. Tonight I will sleep in peace for the first time. Some argue that all we need to do is just preach the gospel. I would argue that the work of Rafa House is preaching the gospel. I would argue that if you let your heart get so hard that you do not feel burdens for little ones like E, well, that has become a greater burden. Last question. Do my lips speak for God when others won't? Who would dare suggest that God has lost his capacity to roar? If he roared in the days of Amos, does he not roar today when he sees the exact same sin among his people? <clears throat> what must be found is the courage for us to be the mouthpiece of God. Remember, the call for us is to be faithful. The prayer is that we would be fruitful, but we must be faithful even if we don't see the fruit. William Barclays, written about a group of soldiers during World War II who lost a friend in the midst of one of their battles. And they wanted to give their fallen comrade a, a decent burial, so they found this little church with a graveyard behind the church building, and it was surrounded by a white fence. They went to the parish priest, and they, they asked if their friend could be buried there in the church graveyard, and the priest asked, was he Catholic? He said, no, he wasn't. I'm sorry, then, the priest said. Our, our graveyard is reserved for members of the Holy Church, but you can bury your friend just outside the fence, and I will make sure personally that his grave is tended to. Well, thank you, Father, the soldiers replied, and they proceeded to bury their friend just outside of the fence at that graveyard. So when the war was finally over, before those soldiers all went back home, they decided that they wanted to visit the gravesite of their friend. They remembered where that church was. They went and found it, and they remembered where they buried him, just outside of the fence, and they searched, and they could not find him. They finally had to go ask the priest if he knew where the grave was. We can't find our friend's grave, they said. The priest said, well, after you buried your fallen friend, it just did not seem right to me that he should be buried there outside the fence. So you moved his grave? No, I moved the fence. That is exactly what God has done for us. We, we did not deserve a place inside the fence. We don't deserve to go to heaven when we die, but God has graciously moved the fence. He sent His Son, Jesus, to die for us so that we could actually be included in His forever family. Romans chapter 5. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. We are called to, to speak this amazing truth to anyone that would have an ear to hear. Many won't listen. Some will. Henry Thoreau once went to jail rather than pay a poll tax to a state that supported slavery. When 
good friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson, hurried to go and visit him in jail. Peering through the bars, he asked, Henry, what are you doing in there? And Thoreau replied, no, Ralph, the question is, what are you doing out there? I believe God is still aiming at us. And as a church, we have come a long way on the road to being advocates for justice for those who need a voice. We heard from Freedom for Youth this morning. It's a way to get easily involved. The unborn. We must speak and be his mouthpiece. We still have a long way to go. My prayer is that you will be engaged and that you will not let the, the, the message of the Lord of Amos to stay on deaf ears. You will hear the same roar.